Hi, the AFG 31K series consists of a range of instruments, 14-bit uh, instruments for creating signals during electronic product design, test and production. This video review covers some of the interesting features of the series, but there is a written review in the comments section as well that covers a lot more and includes information on tests and projects that really need that written detail to help explain them better. So if you're interested, please do refer to that review and some of the information that will be there is also shown in the photos here. Anyway, this video will cover how to access the instrument to generate waveforms and some of the features and things that are possible with the instrument in a more condensed, brief fashion compared to the written review. The AFG 31K is a very modern, recent instrument series costing from about 2K for the upgradable bandwidth single channel model up to 15K USD for the full featured dual channel version. And the key benefits are that there's a sample based mode called advanced mode that allows for amplitude and sample perfect sequencing from files. And also there's a monitoring capability called InstaView and there's extremely low jitter down to two picoseconds. And also there's custom apps capability allowing the users to be able to build up unique test beds with extra functionality. It's a very modern instrument, so it has a great user workflow system too, where you can select either a basic traditional mode to use the instrument or a more advanced sample-based mode. And then virtually all of the configuration is on a single screen with virtually no embedded or hidden menus, which makes it a lot easier to use and reduces misconfiguration compared to old instruments. Everything is software upgradable, apart from the number of channels. The bandwidth is purchasable from 25 MHz through to 250 MHz for sine waves, a bit less for square waves, and uh, actually there's also a huge amount of memory as standard. 16 mega samples per channel by default, but it goes up to 128 mega samples uh, through licensing. There's also a sequencing capability for programmatic control of repeat patterns. The instrument looks really nice and although in some respects it's huge, because of the form factor it actually takes up very little depth and so for home workers it's really neat. I'm using the Art of Electronics here for size comparison. The whole test bed here was used for phase noise measurement with an MDO or mixed domain oscilloscope providing the spectrum analysis and this would also work with the more recent MDO models as well. The phase noise example here is covered later on in the video. After switch on, this is the main menu, and from here you can launch into the basic or the advanced mode, or launch into the built-in waveform builder too. Most of the time you'll want to go into the basic mode, which provides a channel 1 and channel 2 display, and the usual sine, square wave, etc. selection, and frequency and amplitude adjustments and so on. I like that pretty much everything that needs to be configured fits on the display, and there is no deep configuration buried in hidden menus like older instruments. Basically everything that should be configurable is visible on the screen. And if you're working on a channel, you can expand it. If I select a more complex setting like modulation or burst mode, then more of the display gets used and it's all there on the screen at once. There's only one pop-up menu from the bottom. It contains the few minor settings which you'd hardly ever need to change, like copying from one channel to another or setting overall limits to prevent the device under test from being damaged. You can also set the load setting there as well. Also, there's a cool capability here to be able to synchronize multiple AFG in units together. And the information here walks you through how to do that, what connections are needed and so on. This lower pop-up menu is infrequently needed. And most of the time, the user will be interacting with the channel display panes here. You can go back at any time to the main selection page by pressing the home key. For the advanced mode, it's easier to think of it as a waveform sample file based mode, and you can build up a palette of your potentially desired waveforms on the left side. They can then be dragged to build up a sequence list on the right pane by dragging to either the channel one or the channel two columns. And then for each of the rows in the sequence list, you can select if you wish to repeat a number of times or jump to elsewhere in the list, and you can save this sequence as well. When the instrument plays out the sequence, you can control the clock rate that is output at. To summarize, that's the two modes, basic mode providing all the usual controls as seen on signal generators, and the advanced mode, which provides a sample perfect, clocked out, sequenced waveforms capability. Back from the top home menu, the built-in ARB Builder application capability provides a method to design or manipulate custom waveform files, 
And the example here shows a speech waveform that was stored as a WAV file on a PC and then converted into the Tektronix format and then transferred across using a memory, USB memory stick into the AFG31K internal file system. There's various things that can be done to manipulate the waveform or it can all be done on a PC and transferred across. For example, I can shift the waveform by adding an offset so it's good for making quick adjustments on the fly without needing to keep accessing the PC to create new files or to transfer them across. You can actually just directly edit and save them from here. In summary, those are the three main applications on the instrument. Arb Builder providing the waveform creation or editing capability and the basic and advanced modes as shown. But it's also possible to install new applications and one is discussed later in the video. In terms of the arbitrary waveform file creation, there are many other ways to do that as well. One method, which I think will work with any Tektronix scope from the past decade at least, is to just copy the desired signal from the scope and then insert the US memory key into the AFG31K and then open it using the Arb Builder application. You can then drag cursors and cut to the desired portion of the trace that you want to play out. For this unusual waveform, I'm trying to capture just one cycle and then make sure that the start and end of it occurs such that when the waveform is repeated it will join seamlessly. Although I'm doing this on the instrument, there is PC software to do this, but you could also make use of Python or MATLAB to work with various data sources and then convert them to the correct format. Once a waveform has been created, you can use either the basic or the advanced mode to play that waveform out. And there it is, the scope is now seeing the signal from the AFG31K. I can change the frequency and amplitude and offset just as if it were a built-in standard waveform. Moving on to InstaView, this is a feature that displays a view like an oscilloscope of the waveform at the point of entry into the device under test. This is super important when working with 50 ohm connections and high frequencies because if the device or connections are faulty then the signal can be very different to what was expected and you might never know without examining it. Um, a good way of explaining that is by showing this circuit here. Um, it's a circuit with four ports, so there's two inputs and two out outputs on here. Uh, the two inputs to this circuit are connected to the AFG31000 and one of the outputs is connected to a 50 ohm load and the other output just happens to go to an oscilloscope connected to a 50 ohm load as well. Uh, but the point here is that this is a power splitter splash combiner circuit basically but uh, all of the ports, the inputs and outputs, they all need to be uh, matched to 50 ohms impedance and if any of these are incorrect or if a cable breaks or anything uh, then the circuit won't function and ordinarily to monitor this I'd probably need a couple of at least a couple of oscilloscope channels to monitor the, the signals and uh, with the AG31000 I, I don't need that um, I can monitor it all directly from the um, from the instrument so for example here I've got just a couple of square waves set up and you can see this the combined output there and the cool thing is if I change the phase here uh, it should display it really well on the on the screen so if I if I try and change the phase you can see here the green arrow just kind of showing the lead or the lag and you can see the impact of that on the oscilloscope as an example um, but here you're, you're seeing the, the signal which is the, the instrument has been programmed up for uh, but you could also be interested in seeing directly what's at the point of the circuit um, at, at, that like, at the locations at, at the inputs of the circuit, what, what is the signal being seen right there? And uh, with InstaView, you, you, can, you configure it pretty much like a vector network analyzer where you calibrate out your cables first. I've already done that. Um, and then you can turn on the channels here. So I'm interested in setting InstaView up for both channels and then click OK. And this turns into like an oscilloscope type view. So I can see a square wave there. Uh, but more importantly, I can also see, see the amplitude there. So it's 0.987, so about one volt amplitude there. And similarly for the other channel, it's about the same as well. Um, and uh, that's all set up and it's working. Now, if there was a fault anywhere here, like for example, if, uh, if this load got disconnected, you can straight away see the signal has changed here. So even without having a second instrument connected up or anything, I can see that 
there's an imbalance and there's a fault in the circuit. And I can also see the amplitudes have changed. So 1.685 volts there and 1.6 volts there as well. If I correct that, I'm back to one volt again. And uh, as an example, if I pull out one of these, again, I can see instantly from here, 1.9 volts and one volt here. So uh, this is not being terminated correctly and something's wrong in the circuit. In this case, the, the connection has been broken. Here's a scenario where many of the AFG31K features were required. The InstaView capability came in handy simply because there's not enough oscilloscope channels to monitor all the signals. The circuit is an analog device's lock-in amplifier, also known as a synchronous demodulator, and two signals are being generated from the instrument. On channel 2, one of the signals is a clock frequency of 400 kHz, which is driving the lock-in amplifier's internal circuitry, and there's a trigger output from the circuit which needs to be used to synchronise a stimulus signal from the AFG's channel 1. There's more information in the written review to explain it all, but to cut a long story short, the circuit is highly sensitive to the correct phase and frequency down to a fraction of a hertz, and this can be used to pull out weak signals from noisy environments. If I deliberately set the wrong frequency, even by just 0.1 hertz, the signals from the circuit are no longer steady as shown on the oscilloscope. The frequency has to be exact for the signals to become steady. If I adjust the phase, the signals change but remain steady. If those signals were connected to a low-pass filter, then the output amplitude would represent the phase difference, provided that the input amplitude was known. The AFG31K performed really well for this complex scenario, and it allowed me to experiment with different waveforms, as well as inserting noise to test out the circuit. Here's a simple way to do a phase noise measurement to see the quality of the signal from the AFG31K. Phase noise is that noise which is very close to the signal being generated and it's normally very undesirable because it's very difficult to filter off unlike, say, harmonics. The first step is to get hold of any filter and characterise it to see where the stop band is and the level of attenuation. Here on the right hand side of the spectrum analyzer display you can see the pass band and there's some ripple there that is due to the filter construction. But on the left hand side you can see the stop band. The reason the filter will be useful is because the aim will be to generate a signal from the AFG31K that is deliberately in the stop band of the filter in order to reduce the power so that it doesn't overload the spectrum analyzer. Then the amount of phase noise can be measured off within the passband. I'm using a Tektronix MDO3000 here where it's surprisingly easy to do what's normally a complicated measurement because with that instrument all you need to do is put a marker at the offset at which you wish to measure the noise and in my case I've got it offset by 10 kilohertz and right on the display it says minus 134 dBm per hertz and because I've got the AFG31K set to 0 dBm output that means that I can directly use that result all I've got to do is compensate by the smaller amount of loss in the passband which happens to be about 5 dB for the filter that I'm using so that means that I'm seeing a phase noise of around approximately minus 130 dBc per hertz this was actually quicker to do with the MDO3000 than using a dedicated spectrum analyzer. The final part of this video review covers an additional application that can be installed into the instrument. It's a really neat app called Double Pulse, which is designed for power semiconductor testing, such as MOSFETs and diodes. It can also be used with fancy semiconductors like silicon carbide, which can handle high voltages and power, but you wouldn't necessarily want to destroy them while testing. The standard way that manufacturers suggest is to use a H-bridge or a fraction of a H-bridge circuit to perform the testing, but it requires very accurate pulse widths and timing. The reason can be seen in the diagram here. The idea is to turn on a MOSFET under test and current will ramp up through the circuit as the flux rises in the inductor. Effectively, you're programming a test current by the length of time that the pulse lasts for. At switch off, you can capture on an oscilloscope the MOSFET behaviour at that programmed current value. Meanwhile, the current freewheels through the diode at this point. Next, a second pulse is generated, and the programmed current gets switched on by the MOSFET, and again, that can be captured by an oscilloscope and a current probe. The two pulses have therefore resulted in being able to measure the off and the on characteristics at a defined current. Here you can see the double pulse application in use and the testbed. 
the application worked brilliantly. It provides for safe setting of the pulse parameters to be able to use an optocoupler to safely control the MOSFET gate for just the right periods to be able to perform the measurement tasks without accidentally destroying the semiconductors. A single silicon carbide device can cost 10 or $15 or more, so you don't really want to damage them. The scope trace here shows what happens when a semiconductor is tested. The purple current trace was measured using a sense resistor. It is curved instead of straight because I deliberately inserted additional resistance into the circuit while I was proving out the testbed using a small power supply and a prototyped circuit. The actual circuit would need to be placed in an enclosure to protect from accidentally exploding semiconductors while running the test. This is a close-up of the testbed circuit. It's actually near identical to a design in a Cree slash wolf speed datasheet, except it is simplified slightly. At the lower right, you can see the silicon carbide MOSFET shielded slightly from the current sense resistor and connection. Just above that is a silicon carbide diode, and above that is the inductor to program the desired current. This whole circuit needs to be moved to a real printed circuit board, along with a heatsink and enclosure, before it can really be used fully. With some flexibility in the PCB layout for the component footprints, this design should be useful for characterising MOSFETs, diodes and inductors. I really like that a decent power semiconductor testbed could be created with the AFG31K and I'm looking forward to working more with silicon carbide devices too. Thanks for watching this video. To summarise, using the AFG31K was extremely smooth and the highlights for me were the ease of use, the excellent advanced mode for working with waveforms accurately and the extremely low jitter even between channels and the really nice double pulse app. I'm excited to see what new applications appear in the future and I believe with the flexibility provided by the instrument it will provide good service for many years to come for design, test and production engineers. Thanks again for watching.